Thank you, Madam Speaker, and it's indeed a pleasure to be able to rise and speak on Bill C-22, a piece of legislation that us as the official opposition have a lot of apprehension about. Uh, I'd like to just refer to uh, the, the earlier uh, speech that was done both uh, by my uh, colleague from Durham as well as a colleague from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, uh, and laying out uh, and clearly articulating some of the shortfalls that were seen in Bill C-22. I want to just put it on the record uh, to start off, Madam Speaker, that as someone that has been here for over 12 years, as a parliamentarian that has nothing but the greatest respect for this chamber and this institution, uh, I want to just say that, that I do believe that Parliament has a key role in providing oversight to uh, all sorts of government agencies, which include our security and intelligence agencies. Unfortunately, the Bill of Goods that is being presented in Bill C-22 falls far short of giving proper parliamentary oversight. Now, as it's already been alluded to and as discussion has already uh, taken place, there is a concern that already, before the committee has been struck, before the legislation has been passed and properly studied at committee, that a chair of the committee has already been named the member for Ottawa South. And I suppose that we shouldn't be too surprised about that, knowing that the Prime Minister's BFF, uh, Jerry Butts, and, and his Chief of Staff, Katie Telford, uh, used to work for the former Premier Dalton McGuinty, the brother of the me uh, member from Ottawa South. So, uh, you know, that, that is a, a connection that, that a lot of people have made, and one that we know is one of, of concern on whether or not this committee will have true independence and be able to function the way that we expect parliamentary committees to function. Now, as we know when we look at this and we debate it and we've had uh, conversations in here already about what our other 5 I partners are doing, being the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and of course Canada, uh, this is a function that has been missing in Canada over the years. Now, one of those reasons is um, that we have within the Canadian system ombudsmen and commissioners that oversee most of the intelligence agencies uh, like CSEC and uh, Canadian Communication Security Establishment Canada that operates under national defense and as parliamentary secretary, as formerly parliamentary secretary of the Minister of National Defense, uh, well aware of the activities of the organization and as the defense critic, uh, still appreciate the role that the commissioner plays uh, in, in being independent and reviewing all the activities that are done to ensure that CSEC stays in compliance. The same thing that happened with CSIS. And when there is issues, they report it immediately to Parliament. And uh, we get the information that, that we need to make a decision as parliamentarians. Now, what we're seeing in Bill C-22 is not a committee of Parliament. It does not mirror what's happening in the United Kingdom or in Australia, where the committee is appointed by Parliament. The committee functions as a parliamentary committee and what we are seeing here is something that is actually working out of the Prime Minister's office of what's being proposed. Now, the, 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 if you look at the United Kingdom, and we always want to go back to the mother Westminster Parliament in, in, in London, and they established their committee back in 1994 and it has worked incredibly well because politics is left at the door they work in, in collaboration, and they look over the operational uh, and security measures that agencies are taking within the uh, government. Now, 2013, Parliament actually even expanded that committee's role. And I think it is important that this is done because the committee reports back to Parliament. It is not beholden to the Prime Minister. It is not beholden to any Minister of the Crown. Australia also has a parliamentary joint committee. And again, it was set up by Parliament. And it oversees six different security agencies. And again, we see this as being the proper way to do it, in that Parliament has control of committee. Now, I know that there's some concern here that, that you know, when we look at the history of this place, and uh, just probably recent history is when we established the uh, special committee on Afghan detainees and the transfer of those detainees and how those 
individuals were treated by uh, the Canadian Armed Forces and uh, what happened to them after they left, um, that there was first a, a, a way, we were looking at having an all-party committee, but uh, the um, NDP of the day decided not to participate on the committee because it would have to be done in secret and information gleaned through that process could not be used in the public domain. And so they took a pass on sitting on the committee and so just the Liberals and the Conservatives uh, sat on that committee and went through thousands and thousands of unredacted documents to try to determine whether or not there was any abuse, which they determined there wasn't. Now, I can see why the Liberals are up here speaking in favour of Bill C-22 because I think they're, they're somewhat confused because if you look at their uh, promises in the last Parliament, they talked about the well, pr promises in the last election campaign, Madam Speaker, and it says on page 31, national security oversight, and it says we will deliver stronger national security oversight. At pr pr present, Parliament does not have oversight over national security agencies, making Canada the sole nation among our five eyes whose elected officials cannot scrutinize security operations. This leaves the public uninformed and unrepresented on critical issues. Key word here, Parliament does not have oversight. And what this bill is doing is an all-party committee, but it's not a parliamentary committee. And of course, this follows in, if you read this, this through, it, says, uh, it goes right ahead within the uh, uh, red book from the, the last federal campaign for the Liberals, parliamentary committees, and says that we will strengthen parliamentary committees so that they can better scrutinize legislation, and brought forward great ideas of making sure that they're have, have nonpartisan research, that they're going to have uh, committee chairs elected uh, by secret ballot. You know, and they talk about having ministers and parliamentary secretaries removed from, from committee and not being able to vote on committee. So everybody assumes that when you're going to do parliamentary committees, make them more independent and, and allow members of parliament to work and elect chairs, that, that would happen with the national security oversight. But I can see how members from the Liberal Caucus would be confused because the two of them went one right after the other and, and uh, they would just assume that they're going to have a true parliamentary committee. And, you know, if you look to the, the comments and rhetoric that have come from the, op uh, from, from the government in the past, and I, uh, you know, I listened earlier to the member from Malpec, and he has been in this place for, for a long time and has made some, some um, comments about wanting to have parliamentary oversight. And, he's, and I'll just quote him here. He, he said when, when he was um, speaking in the House in the last parliament, the key point here is that I really cannot understand the government's unwillingness to look at proper parliamentary oversight. The key word, parliamentary. And he again said later, I'm strongly advocating oversight parliamentary oversight. This was in the debate on Bill C-51 and one of the demands. Now, also the member from Vancouver Quadra brought forward Bill C-622 and it was about trying to establish legislation to provide more security ag agency oversight through Parliament. So, I can see why there's confusion amongst Canadians. I can see why there's confusion in the Liberal Caucus when they actually have always talked about parliamentary oversight, but what we're seeing today is that this process in Bill C-22 is all about having more control by the Prime Minister's office. And I got the bill right in front of me here, Madam Speaker, and I've read through it carefully, and just so I can you know, raise the concerns that, that, and the reason I have these concerns about the way this committee is being established. If you look in Section 4 on Bill C-22, it says clearly in, in, in Section 4, Subsection 3, the committee is not a committee of either the House of Parliament or of both Houses. So we're not talking about a committee of Parliament. It has no responsibility to Parliament. As a matter of fact, the extra remuneration that's awarded to the Chair and to the committee members will come from general coffers, not through parliamentary budgets. It goes on in Section 5, Subsection 1. The members of the committee are to be appointed by the Governor and Council on the recommendation of the Prime Minister and to hold office during pleasure until the dissolution of Parliament following their appointment. Well, parliamentary committees are established through whips assigning people onto committees, and chairs are elected by the committee. Not this case. This case is the Prime Minister will appoint 
every single member of the committee. Now, on the Senate side, it says that the Prime Minister will consult with a member of the Senate uh, and then appoint those members. Now, of course, we have senators that are independent, and those members that are independent, of course, are appointed to the Senate by the, on a recommendation of the Prime Minister, so they are beholden to the Prime Minister. And now the Prime Minister will appoint those independently, Prime Ministerly appointed senators to the committee. So definitely those senators, up to two members on the committee will be from the Senate, will act in the interests of the Prime Minister. And then members of other parties will be appointed by the Prime Minister after he's talked to the leader of that party. Now, that in itself clearly documents the shortcomings in Bill C-22. And I do encourage uh, caucus members uh, in, in the Liberal Party to read through it, to clearly understand the bill of goods that they sold Canadians in the last election was false. If you look at parliamentary privilege, again, to make the point, in Section 12, sub clause 1, it says, despite any other law, no member or former member of the committee may claim immunity based on parliamentary privilege in a proceeding against them in retaliation to a contravention of subsection 11.1 or the provision of the Security of Information Act. So, here in Parliament, we have immunity. We have true freedom of speech. That is removed from this committee making the point that this may be a committee that has parliamentarians on it, but the committee is not part of this institution. It's part of the Prime Minister's office. So, and then we go down to the information that the committee can use. We continue to see, Madam Chair, Ma Madam Speaker, that there is restrictions placed on this committee on the information they glean. There's actually seven exemptions keeping the committee from really doing its work. I'm ensuring that intelligent agencies are taking our national security seriously and are protecting the rights and freedoms of individual Canadians. So you have to wonder whether or not the people of Canada, when they elected this government, fully understood that they were not going to get what they really deserve, which is true parliamentary oversight. There is exceptions. Members are appointed by the Prime Minister. Uh, ministers have the right to refuse to give information uh, of any department. You know, so, so if there's any department that the committee wants to investigate, ministers can refuse that information. So even before they're out of the gate, they're already handcuffed. They're bound and they're gagged and they're completely beholden to the PMO. The other thing that I have trouble with is that this committee, that the chair has a vote on all proceedings. We see that only occasionally in our parliamentary process here, on special joint legislative committees where, where a chair has a vote on uh, policies and, and debates and motions in, in, in committee, and also can then cast a time um, or vote to break a, a, a tie as well. And this is being suggested here is that the chair of the committee gets to vote plus gets to cast the ballot to break all votes. So uh, essentially even though they're saying that there's going to be four liberals uh, as it sits today on this committee, there's actually five because the chair has two votes. Now, um, get down into the reports in section 21 and Again, the report isn't presented to Parliament. The committee writes a report and it's presented to the Prime Minister and to the Minister or Ministers that it impacts. They get to vet all the reports. How is that freedom of speech? How is that the ability of us as parliamentarians to do our job when the committee reaches a decision, it still gets vetted by the PMO? It still will get vetted by the affected minister. And I can tell you that that is beyond the pale of proper parliamentary procedure and democracy. Now, the, the, not, not only do they vet it, it actually says right in the legislation in, 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 in um, section 21, uh, subsection 5, that 
the, the chair of the committee will get direction from the prime minister or from the minister on how to properly write the report if they aren't happy with what's in it. It says, Prime Minister may direct the committee to submit to the Prime Minister a revised version of the annual special report that does not contain the information that they're concerned about. So, you know, there is some major political gains and games that we played in this process and is something that needs to be seriously looked at for amendment uh, if you're going to see Canadians have faith in this process. Now, as you get through this, it, it, it just continues on with the ministers, has a decision to ref uh, refuse to provide any information. Uh, the committee can write a report of dissatisfaction with that minister, but at the same time uh, has no control over whether or not that report will even get tabled. So there isn't the checks and balances, Madam Speaker, on what we need to see in Bill C-22. And that's why, as the opposition, the official opposition, we're opposing the bill, unless there's some substantive changes made. Now, I know that the member from Durham has tried on a number of occasions to reach out to the Minister of Public Safety, to reach out to uh, our Liberal counterparts, along with the member from Victoria and the NDP caucus, to ensure that we develop a piece of legislation that everyone here would be comfortable with supporting. Unfortunately, that fell on deaf ears. Now, this bill was tabled in the dying days of the uh, su summer session, just before the summer recess in June. So we never had a chance to have a proper discussion before summer break on this bill. Uh, and really only getting our opportunity now to express our concerns over what is a poorly drafted piece of legislation. Canadians expect more. If you're going to provide parliamentary oversight, it better be true parliamentary oversight and not just a function and an extension of the Prime Minister's office, wielding their authority over us as parliamentarians. I actually, I am baffled, Madam Speaker, why anyone in the Liberal caucus, especially in the backbench, would want to be so tied up by the authority of the PMO. If they want to exercise their rights and obligations as members of parliament in this house and represent their constituents, they would be demanding that this bill become a true extension of parliament, that it would be set up the same way we set up our standing committees. It would become part of the standing orders, that the committee would be able to elect its own chair and that the reports would be tabled here in this house. Now, we do agree that the members that sit on this committee should be properly vetted of all parties. We do agree uh, that everyone should be sworn to take, or should take an oath, or swear to take an oath, to commit themselves to protecting that uh, uh, information that they're going to see. Uh, this is an information that should be used for partisan political purposes. This is about the security of our nation and the protection of Canadians, as well as the protection of the rights and freedoms of Canadians. We also, Madam Speaker, believe that people that sit on this committee have experience on issues of national security, national defense, and policing. That what they're going to see and the information they're going to, going to look at does in no way startle them or may have them making ill-informed decisions. So we do really urge the government to fix this legislation so that you can find all party support. But until it does, the official opposition, the Conservative Party of Canada, will oppose this since it does not reflect the promises made by the Prime Minister in the last federal <coughs> election. It does not respect this institution, nor will it, in its current form, 
as proposed in Bill C-22, achieve what we hoped it would achieve in proper parliamentary oversight. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments, questions et commentaires. Uh, the Honourable Member for Toronto Danforth. Um, well, I would like to thank my colleague from Selkirk, Interlake Eastman, for his comments. Um, I have to admit, I, I am a bit confused. He, he pointed out that there was confusion, and, and I am confused because um, when I, I listen to his comments, um, Madam Speaker, about, about checks and balances and the need for them, but then I look back to the history and I look back to the past decade and, and I see a history of private members' bills having been brought uh, by members of the Liberal Party um, who, have le who have been bringing these bills to try and get this kind of parliamentary oversight and, and, and yet it, it was never done. And, and then now I'm, I'm sitting here and I, I am hearing that we are taking action and that's somehow upsetting. And, and so my question, Madam Speaker, is, is Perhaps he can explain to me the history of why over the past decade there was no national oversight committee uh, put into place uh, by the former government. And perhaps he can um, explain to me uh, wh where his upset is now. Is it, is it the fact that there is action being taken to finally create this committee? The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. Well, I can see why Madam Speaker, the member opposite is confused, because she actually thinks they're getting parliamentary oversight and you're not. And, and that's what we are opposed to in, in this bill. That this bill has to have the ability to empower us as parliamentarians. It does not do this. It empowers the PMO. And, Madam Speaker, if you look at the previous uh, 10 years, Peter McKay actually supported more parliamentary oversight on national security agencies. There's a number of us here that actually believe that we need to have more parliamentary oversight. And unfortunately, we didn't see cooperation from all the other parties on how to do that uh, in, in a responsible manner. And so that was laid to rest. But we have the opportunity now to do it right. Bill C-22 is getting it wrong, and all you're doing is putting more power in the hands of the Prime Minister, Gerald Butts, and Katie Telford. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? Honorable député de Longueuil, Saint-Hubert. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Écoutez, je ne peux pas m'empêcher de réagir fortement parce que quand j'entends le député de St. Kirk Interlake évoquer la toute puissance du PMO, c'est quand même très drôle. Pour quelqu'un qui est ici de notre côté, de se rappeler à quel point de l'autre bord, dans l'ancien Parlement, c'était justement le plein contrôle par le bureau du premier ministre. Ce qui est décevant, puis je reconnais avec lui, par contre, c'est que, évidemment, ce n'est pas du tout ça qui nous a été vendu pendant la dernière campagne électorale. Puis à ce sujet, je pense qu'effectivement, il y a matière à se questionner sur, euh, sur le rôle que le gouvernement libéral euh, confie aux différents députés qui représentent toutes les régions du Canada. Et, et j'aimerais demande, demander à mon collègue s'il ne croit pas qu'il y a une forme de manque de confiance envers les députés, le fait que, par exemple, euh, on, on, on s'octroie euh, la présidence du côté du premier ministre. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. Well, I thank the uh, member for his comment, uh, Madam Speaker. And, and first of all, you know, the, how he's enjoyed in the last election, everybody always said, oh, that was a big bad PMO and under Stephen Harper, and you guys were all told what to do. In the last parliament, the most independent voting member of parliament was myself. And yet everybody, I didn't see Liberals or NDP vote as often against their own party line as, as, as myself or some of my other colleagues who were second and third. So, you know, that isn't a fair analysis. But I will say this. There is a lack of trust in, uh, from our side and my side in, in C-22 because, Madam Speaker, it does not address the promise made by the Liberals or what those of us who respect Parliament would like to see a parliamentary committee through the statutes of Parliament and through the standing orders that could be created and provide the same type of order of oversight that does, is talked about in, in the legislation, but not under the control of the Prime Minister. And unfortunately, what we have here is that all the control, all the vetting, all the reports have to first and foremost go through the Prime Minister's office. And that is not democracy. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samilkameen Nicola. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I just want to thank uh, this member for his contribution to this debate. I know he's a very plain-spoken gentleman uh, from his area, and, uh, you know, I believe he believes in telling it like it is. And so I'd like to ask him the question, is the current name of the committee uh, is, I believe, National Security and, and Intelligence uh, Parliamentary Committee. Would he be more comfortable with maybe labeling it uh, the Prime Minister's Parliamentary Committee or perhaps uh, the chosen people by the Prime Minister to talk about uh, items that he, uh, he has ordained? Uh, just maybe that might be more accurate and represent what the, this bill is doing. Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Thank uh, my friend for his, his um, question. I don't know if the comment about being plain spoken is a <laughs> backhanded compliment, but <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I would just say this, that, that uh, you know, this isn't a parliamentary committee, and maybe they should call it an all-party committee for the Prime Minister on national security intelligence issues. You know, that would probably be the, the, the best way, and, and uh, they'll, they'll definitely go through the process of making it look like it's a parliamentary committee, but we know for a fact, Parliament does not approve this committee, Parliament has no say in what the committee does. And Parliament will not see, see the reports coming from the committee until after it's been vetted and rewritten by the Prime Minister's office. So uh, until that point in time, Madam Speaker, that, that uh, the, the government realizes the folly in Bill C-22, uh, will we uh, unfortunately not have a committee that is providing the oversight that Canadians want and what Canadians were led, led to believe in the last federal election? Comments, questions et commentaires. The Honourable Member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This um, strikes me, frankly, as an opportunity to vent against the Prime Minister's office, something my friend and his colleagues haven't been able to do for 10 years. Um, so I hope you're enjoying your newfound freedom. Um, I apologize. The questions to the chair. My question is, is quite simple. I'm not sure if he's opposed to parliamentary oversight. And if he is not, my question is simply this. Why didn't you pass legislation that you would like? Why didn't my friend's government pass legislation that they would like, rather than wait till now to criticize us when the opportunity has been put before the House? The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake East. Well, Madam Speaker, the member from Etobicoke Lake Shore knows full well that this committee that's proposed in C-22 does not provide parliamentary oversight. It's an all-party caucus really is all it is. It does not have the tools to provide uh, true oversight and report back to us here in Parliament. What we are saying is that we want to have parliamentary oversight and we want to work in a responsible manner. You know, that, those are some of the apprehensions that we had as government. Uh, and I can see that based upon this bill, it's still the, the apprehensions that the PMO has today because they are controlling the committee. And uh, so uh, if those apprehensions exist, then there, there should have been no promise by the Liberals in the last campaign that they were going to provide parliamentary oversight, because they are not doing that. What they've done is provide more vetting and more uh, control by the PMO over anything that this committee does, and over a number of uh, parliamentarians who, in this process, give up their, their, their immunity and their privilege that's guaranteed to them uh, in this House if it was done as a parliamentary committee. And comments, questions, et commentaires. The Honourable Member for Sonia Lambton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his excellent speech. Uh, one of the concerns that I have um, are the loopholes in this bill to allow uh, the community to not have the oversight that they need. And I'm thinking about um, Section 8B, for example, where um, if a minister is, has department is under investigation, he could claim that uh, it was an issue of national security and then they wouldn't be able to look into it. And certainly I think that, you know, with parliamentarians we have a, a degree of integrity and confidentiality. So that's one of the exemptions that I see and I wondered if the member could talk about some of the other exemptions. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. And uh, my colleague from starting in Lambton makes a great point, Madam Speaker. You know, why would we call it the National Security and Intelligence Committee? when any minister can determine that a review would be injurious to national security, so you can't look at it. So, so it, the hypocrisy in this legislation is, out, uh, is beyond the pale. And the seven exemptions that, that, that uh, go beyond that is that a committee can't, is not entitled to information that is confidence to the Queen's Privy Council because not, nobody's going to be sworn in as members of Privy Council here. They're just going to be taking an oath under the Secrecy Act. 
Uh, they aren't going to be able to provide any, uh, get any information respect, respecting ongoing defense intelligence of gathering for national security. So the list goes on. There, there's seven total exemptions, and always the prime minister or ministers will hide under the veil of national security, and you're not entitled to see it, even though you're the National Security and Intelligence Committee.